What makes you, you? What are these core elements without which you would no longer recognize yourself? It could be that you're an athlete. You're a quick learner. What if these things were taken away from you? It could be a stroke or Alzheimer's disease wiping out most of your memories. How do these illnesses impact our sense of self? Before it's a concept and the topic of a dissertation, the self is an experience for each and every one of us. We all have an intimate sense of what it's like to be us. And yet, for centuries, the self has been largely ignored by scientists because of its subjectivity. So can there be a science of the self? Can we build an objective, measurable account of this very subjective, individual experience? In pursuit of this question, I've done a PhD in philosophy and then another one in neuropsychology. This interdisciplinary approach gives me a unique angle, one in which our theory of the self is directly relevant to patients' lives. In 2007, I met Michael. Michael had a stroke. From the outside, he seems to be in a vegetative state. For years, we didn't even know he was conscious. But the location of his lesion, right under his brain, left his brain largely intact, if unable to communicate with the rest of his body. Michael suffers from a condition called the locked-in syndrome. He lives in a wheelchair, unable to move by himself or speak to his loved ones. If you had such a stroke, would you still be you? The way we answer this question matters because it shapes the medical decisions, sometimes life or death, that we, as families or healthcare providers, make for these patients. And the way we've answered this question so far has been by projecting what we perceive from the outside, so to speak, from the armchair. Instead, I argue that in order to understand the impact of these strokes on these people's sense of self, we needed to shift our perspective to that of the patient, from the armchair to the wheelchair. But asking Michael is difficult. We have to use his brain activity. The brain of healthy people, as much as that of patients, activates in similar manners when we think about the same things. We can use this as a communication code to ask these patients how this stroke has impacted their sense of self. First, I asked doctors, and two-thirds of them told me, no, they won't feel like themselves. The extent of the objective damage is just too great. And then I asked 44 patients just like Michael, and two-thirds of them told me, yeah, it's still me. Objectively, there's been a lot of change, but subjectively, it still feels like me. 15 million people in the world have a stroke every year. It is the leading cause of paralysis. And in order to improve the medical decisions we make for the care of these patients, it is important that we shift our perspective and account better for their subjective experience. But we wouldn't be able to do so without the proper tools. And because the self has been largely kept outside of scientific inquiry for so long, my first task has been to create such tools. The same year I met Michael, artist William Uttermolen died in London with Alzheimer's disease, leaving behind this famous series of self-portraits. At the time, most neuroscientists believed that patients with Alzheimer's disease undergo a progressive and eventually complete loss of self. As they lose their memories, the way they see themselves changes. But do they lose their sense of self? Meet Maria. Maria is an 86-year-old lady who suffers from Alzheimer's disease. I meet her during one of my first clinical rotations in a geriatric unit. Every night around 5 p.m., Maria becomes agitated and tries leaving the hospital. 
The existing tools quantify precisely for the doctors how much of her memory Maria has lost. She no longer remembers having been married, having had children, let alone grandchildren. She appears delusional, speaking of dead people, and the medical team is considering restraining her. Instead of focusing on what has been lost, I developed a tool that aims at assessing how much of herself might still be preserved. And using this tool, I asked Maria to describe herself in her own words for two minutes. And for the first time, Maria says she's a teenage girl and she needs to go now because her mama wants her home before it gets dark out. It's the winter, it gets dark around 5 p.m. every night. Maria has a sense of self. It no longer matches the 86-year-old face we see, but it matches the subjective memories she still has. Creating these tools allow us to meet the patients where they're at, to adjust their care accordingly, and to explain to their families what is going on. And now that we have these tools, we can investigate how the self relates to other important health outcomes. Survivors of sexual assault are five times more likely to die by suicide than others. Using one of the scales I developed to assess their subjective experience of their self, we can predict better than the current gold standard in the field who is at risk for these self-destructive behaviors. And we found similar results among US veterans with combat experience. Together, these results have led me to ask to another population what their experience would be like. And in my latest work, I have researched how a face transplant would impact the experience of a self. Since the world premiere in 2005, there have been 38 face transplants in the world. And the first person to have had two face transplants after the first one got rejected was announced just a few weeks ago. These tools allow us to characterize the impact of this life-changing surgery on these patients' selves and to help them adjust and recognize themselves in their new face. All told, my research has demonstrated that it is possible to create objective, reliable, scientific measures to assess the most subjective experience of ourself, and that these tools yield important, clinically relevant results for the care of patients with a history of stroke, Alzheimer's disease, sexual assault, combat, or face transplant. But when you think about it, every patient who comes to a hospital is facing a situation that challenges their sense of self. And yet no hospital currently has a program geared to help these patients with this specific aspect of their experience in illness. My next step is to create a hospital-based program harnessing the strength of these tools to help our patients face the change the illness is bringing in their lives and allow them to recognize themselves once more. Thank you.